All right, let's go to our Sunday School lesson. We just finished studying the book of Psalms in our Sunday School hour. 150 chapters, or Psalms, and uh, three and a half years later, we finally got to this point. It was worth it. Today, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. Uh, and pardon my handwriting, it kind of veered off course on a couple of lines there. But this is a breakdown, and I don't have an easel to set this on. But the book of Hebrews has 13 chapters, 303 verses, 6,913 words in our Bible. It's the 19th book in the New Testament, or in the New Testament canon. Um, I wrote there the author, the, the Apostle Paul, and uh, the approximate dates of its writing between 45 and 65 A.D. And uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself or any other comments here, but you can look at that later if it's that pressing important to you. Go, if you will, or look, rather, if you will, at Hebrews 1 and the first three verses, Gesundheit. <laughs> Hebrews 1 and verses 1, 2, and 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, that's simply an old English spelling for the word diverse, meaning varied, and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This book begins in an un-Pauline fashion. None of the Apostle Paul's letters, earlier letters to the churches, begin this way. Very often they would say things like, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he would add, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth. But he doesn't begin this letter this way. And for this reason, nobody can say for sure who the author of the book of Hebrews actually uh, is. <clears throat> but we're going to proceed with the assumption that Paul is indeed the author of the book. More about that in a minute. And trust God to teach it to us as we go. The mark of a Bible believer is he believes the book he's holding in his hand is the Bible. And he doesn't presume to correct it or change it or say this was translated poorly or the original said something else. No one has ever found the quote-unquote originals. Amen. They don't exist. And so you cannot say the original said this or the original writing said that because no one's ever found them. So you have to believe that God in his providence and care preserved the scriptures in every generation until they landed in your lap and my lap exactly as God wants them to be. I was sitting in, uh, or rather I went to a McDonald's restaurant and I was waiting for my food and there was a guy sitting at a table and he, was, he had the uh, New Schofield Reference Bible and a copy of Nestle's Greek New Testament which we studied in Bible school. And, um, and I was fresh out of Bible school. I was just curious as what he was doing. I said, what are you reading there? He said, well, I'm studying the Greek New Testament and the New Testament here to, to compare and teach myself. And I, uh, I said, you know, Nestle's Greek New Testament is not the Greek New Testament that the King James text is based upon. So I, I would just point out to you that you've got two, two different texts there. Um, let me ask you, though, have you ever wondered whether there's one perfect book in the world that we can call the Bible and have 100% confidence in from cover to cover so that 
it would never be my job or responsibility to change it. Simply believe it. Believe every word in there is by the, the hand and the direction and the providence of God, exactly as he wants me to read it. And he thought for a second, he said, I don't think there is a book like that. Which is the difference between a Bible believer and a Bible corrector. Many Christians today are Bible correctors, although they, they've never thought about it that way. They've just heard that, well, unfortunately, the King James Bible says this, a better translation might be, or a better rendering might be, or this, that, or the other. And all that does is creates doubt in the minds of the listener, the person sitting in the audience, uh, in the book he's holding in his lap and reading in front of his own face. From 1900 until 2000, that century, there were over 100 English translations put on the market, each one claiming to be an improvement of the one before it. And uh, so a Bible believer believes the book he's holding is the Bible. It's not his job to correct the Bible. The Bible's job is to correct him. Amen. And so, nobody can say for sure who the author of the Apostle Paul is, but we're going to be, proceed with the assumption that he is indeed the author of this book. And um, trust that God will teach it to us as we compare Scripture with Scripture, and let the Scriptures comment on themselves and uh, explain the Scriptures to us. Um, and I, much as we attempted to do in the book of Psalms over the last three and a half years, this book was written to Hebrews, not to saved Jews, as, is, as most commentators uh, often suggest. Not all Hebrews are saved Jews which you'd think would be self-evident, but the authorship has been suggested by numerous scholars to be possibly Barnabas as the author. Some have said Silas might be the author of this book. Uh, one uh, commentator suggested Priscilla and Aquila, the husband and wife uh, believers, may have written the book. Martin Luther was fond of Apollos, 1 Corinthians 1.11, as the possible author of this book and other um, alleged Bible scholars agreeing with him. Uh, and the dates for its writing also vary widely. I put 45 to 65 AD as the possible date for the writing of the book of Hebrews. The earliest date that's commonly suggested is about 51 AD, and a date that's commonly held uh, by many um, what we would call fundamentalists is between 80 and 86 AD. But I don't think that can be the case simply by the fact that Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11 says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, which would suggest that the temple in Jerusalem was still standing. So it had to have been written before 70 AD when Titus and the Romans invaded Israel and destroyed the temple and um, the city. But um, pinning down the author of the book or narrowing down its dates does nothing to shed light on the actual book itself. It doesn't matter. Um, those things are, are secondary in importance, maybe even thirdly and fourthly in importance. This book is an, an, an enigma. It's a difficult for a lot of contemporary Christians because all they know to do, all they've been taught to do by their ministers, uh, is to extrapolate devotional and spiritually inspiring lessons from every book in the Bible. And any text that suggests something other than, by grace are you saved through faith, throws them off. Um, and the book of Hebrews will have plenty of that in it. Brother Charles came to me just a few minutes before our lesson started, and he had a question for me out of the book of Hebrews, and I said, it's funny you should ask me, because that's what we're just about to begin studying. But um, the last nine books of the Bible 
beginning with Hebrews and including the book of Revelation, are what we categorize as the general epistles. They're not written to any one church for New Testament instruction and uh, containing much material that differs from the gospel of the grace of grace through faith. Um, instructions that will have a, a literal application for someone who's left behind after the rapture. The old, in the Old Testament, nobody living under the laws of Moses and the Old Testament commandments had any testimony of the new birth. Nobody in the Old Testament was born again by trusting in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That hadn't happened yet. And nobody saved right now under this age of grace is required to keep Old Testament commandments in order to earn his salvation or to keep his salvation. But after the rapture of the church, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 14, these are they which uh, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's some element of faith and works which will be coupled together following those two dispensations in the tribulation. And that is what uh, the book of Hebrews and the rest of the New Testament uh, will address. Now the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 The Bible tells us what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to study. Modern translations say, do your best, which is very uh, subjective. It tells us why we're supposed to study, to not be ashamed, and for God's approval one day. And then it tells us how we're supposed to study, by rightly dividing the word of truth. Carefully compare scripture with scripture, and uh, then by that discern what applies to you as a believer today, and what applied to the Jew in the Old Testament, what may apply to someone after the church is gone. That's how you rightly divide the word of truth. And so, much as throughout the book of Psalms, although it was written uh, during the time of the law and the commandments of the Old Testament, so much of that spiritually and devotionally we can we apply to ourselves as believers today. But the literal keeping of the law in the Old Testament, when God said, my people, he wasn't referring to you and I as New Testament. When he said, my people, his people were Israel. And in the Old Testament, a righteous man was one who was known for good works. An unrighteous man was someone who was known for bad works. Uh, he, sometimes he was called a fool, sometimes he was called wicked, but he was considered unrighteous. It's sort of how the unsaved man defines everybody today. Well, if I'm really good, I'll get to heaven. If I'm really bad, I'll go to hell. And that is not how heaven or hell are determined today. Heaven or hell, and, or hell um, as your eternal destiny, destination, are um, set based upon your relationship to Jesus Christ. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. And so, just as we reached into the Psalms and repeatedly found things that instruct us and inspire us as believers right now in this church age, so in the general epistles we have to find those things that can be applied to us right now that match what the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches for the instruction of believers as well. Um, and I want you to turn, if you will, to chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. By the way, Hebrews means that men can make coffee just as well as the women can make coffee. Maybe better. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, notice there verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12, verse 10, you need to turn, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Notice verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. We read in 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, 
vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Look at verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, and so forth. Look at verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. By the way, those words, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, are found nowhere in the four Gospels. But we trust that Paul knew what he was writing when he wrote this. Christ said, uh, I, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. But those words, exactly like that, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, are not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So apparently Paul uh, knew something that Christ had uttered that were actually not recorded by the writers of the gospel. We read by Paul, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Philippians 4.11 And then uh, notice verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Paul wrote that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, Ephesians 4, 14. Notice here verse 15. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Ephesians 5, 20 instructs us giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And here, verse 17, says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. The writing style and the common themes of chapter 13 are unmistakable. Paul is the author of chapter 13. There can be no better candidate as the author of this part of the book. But let me consider a few other texts earlier in the book. Go back, if you will, to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, and verse 4, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, verses 9 and 10, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. Look at Hebrews 1 and verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and that all the angels of God worship him. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8.29 tells us. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. 
everything is subject to the authority of Christ. We just haven't seen it manifested yet. And we certainly will at the return of Christ, the second advent. But we read, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Notice there Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 7 and 8, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17 say, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It seems quite obvious that the Apostle Paul is the author of the entire book of Hebrews, the unusual opening of chapter 1 notwithstanding. And it was obvious to the King James translators in 1611. Notice their title to the book. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. Uh, good news for modern man simply says the letter to the Hebrews and the modern translations simply say the letter to the Hebrews and then they give you an introduction note saying this was written to Christians um, and hardly any mention of of Hebrews or Jews uh, being involved um, right after Paul's conversion experience Acts chapter 9 he went to be alone with God and to take in everything that the death and the resurrection of Christ um, signified as God began to reveal himself to Paul. Go back, if you will, to the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 1. Galatians 1, and this is simply introduction this, this afternoon. We'll begin launching into chapter 1, God willing, next week. We'll go verse by verse. But Galatians 1, and begin with verse 15. Paul wrote, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, heathen are Gentiles in the Bible. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. His revelation was of a new body of Jews and Gentiles joined together by Christ, which constitutes the bride of Jesus Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, which had been unheard of, unthinkable prior to that. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, and begin with me at verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, parentheses, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, 
as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What was that mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul is the preeminent apostle to the Gentiles. Paul is the apostle to the New Testament churches. It was not Simon Peter in the Catholic Church, no matter what someone might think. Uh, the Apostle Paul is the preeminent teacher of believers in the New Testament. And his deepest concern, however, his, uh, his abiding concern, however, was that his fellow Jews, Israelites, would also turn to Jesus Christ. Go back, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. No matter where God led the Apostle Paul, this was still a driving uh, desire of his. Romans 10, verses 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now here's a very key verse. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You and I are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the Jew needed to be convinced of that. He needed to be persuaded that it is no more the law of Moses that establishes someone's righteousness before God, but it is now trusting in the righteousness of Christ displayed by his dying for the sake of sinners on the cross of Calvary. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll finish here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And 2 Timothy 4, beginning there with verse 11, 11, 12, and 13. Getting down to the end of Paul's life, he writes, verse 11, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I, left, surely have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with, um, with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Those would be letters uh, Paul was writing, letters he was in the process of writing, and carried about with him until they were finished and ready to send. So it's entirely plausible that the first 12 chapters in the book of Hebrews were written soon after Paul's conversion uh, as he was in Arabia, waiting for God to reveal more to him. Um, he, he cared for them and was desirous that they would turn to Jesus Christ, just as he had, as he was receiving more revelation of the church, the Jews, and the Gentiles, and God was preparing to send him to the Gentile world, the entire Mediterranean world at that time, uh, and he may have written chapter 13 after he understood God's calling to him to the Gentiles as the primary teacher of the Gentiles and the establisher of churches throughout the known world at that time and uh, to instruct Gentiles in this, this thing that had been previously a mystery between Jews and Gentiles that they would now be joined in one body um, but the Jew needed that revelation, and that was his driving concern, his abiding concern. And so wherever he would go, he'd seek out the synagogue where he could go preach there. And we see that in the book of Acts prominently. 
So it's entirely possible that he carried with him these letters, or rather these chapters, at least 1 through 12, for some time before having all the revelation that God wanted to give him concerning the church, the Jew, the Gentile, the mystery of the body of Christ, and then writing chapter 13, with, which ends up matching so much of what he'd written in the previous epistles to churches. So who knows how long he carried um, these texts or <coughs> parchments around with him until these letters were ready to sin, but that one verse would indicate that that was a common practice with him, as it would be for anyone who's working on something, composing something, uh, and it's just not ready to be mailed out yet or sent out yet. 